Hello and welcome to The Rabid Atheist. I'm Ed Raby, a former pastor turned atheist, now a compassionate anti-theist. Welcome to my channel. Feel free to like or dislike the videos you see fit, so feel free to hit those buttons. Feel free to comment below, and I would appreciate it if you would subscribe to the channel and hit your notification bell for more content as it is released. You're also free to share my videos as much as you like, because the purpose of this channel is educational in regards to atheist and deconversion issues, and any issues related to those issues. Uh, today I want to continue on my uh, deconversion story for the year of 2023, the 2023 edition. This is part 10. And today I want to, it's another one of these overarching themes like I did with science fiction and fantasy. I want to talk about how my Pentecostal days as both a Pentecostal believer and a Pentecostal pastor changed my view of Jesus. And this was a very important question, as many of you have already heard if you watched this deconversion story through from the beginning. The life of Christ was a particular struggle of mine because Jesus Christ, when I was a child and a teenager, became my hero. But then the more I began to study the accounts of him, the more I began to realize that this may very well be a false hero, a hero that's made up or a hero that's been embellished. And... As I came to the end of my Pentecostal ministry, I, I basically, as I said in my last video, I burned my card and I, um, my ordination card, and I just kind of uh, faded out. Uh, basically, the personal story is I went into depression again, um, not quite as deep as with my father, but just very debilitating. I know that that's, I was just experiencing a lot of emotional things, a lot of sensory stuff, and. I was just, my nervous system was just overloaded. Uh, the autism really kind of probably kicked in there, and I was just having a real hard time. Managed to find a, a job, basically, again, working for the world's largest brick and mortar again. And um, kind of back to where I started from before I went to my church one and church two, really. And uh, that was very depressing as well. But I had about a six month year time frame there before I started to be considered for another church that I'll talk about. Uh, my last church, my congregational church. Um, but I had about a year there or so, roughly, where I had plenty of time to reflect on my Pentecostal days, and a lot of the observations that I made at that time I still carry with me to this day. And as a believer, as a preacher, I can tell you that I saw a lot of things that were done in the spirit of emotion. Now, the first thing you need to recognize about a Pentecostal service is it's highly emotional. It's designed to gin up your emotions. You have the, the very emotionally related worship music. You have the raising the hands and surrender. You have um, all this um, emotionally related language. Uh, prayers are very much personally directed towards people. So you really develop this emotional, personal connection during this, the service. And in that, things would happen that would be interpreted by the people as miracles or de casting out demons or speaking in tongues or uh, miracles of provision, deliverance, um, you know, just all the stuff. And as I began to look at that, okay, like, I have seen personally, I, of course, I've done a video where I, I have, as an atheist, I've spoken in tongues. Uh, some people have concluded that that means the Holy Spirit hasn't left me and I'm still saved. And I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. I, I just demonstrated to you that you can make that stuff up is what I've demonstrated. I don't feel that way at all. However, what that showed me is that there are certain experiences that can be trained and taught into a person that are very, and you get a person in a certain emotional state, whether they're on an emotional high or an emotional low, you can really implant a lot of things into them. I've talked about this before. And then I saw healings. Now, I'll be frank, the one thing I kept waiting for was like literally, I, I have a, a friend who was a mentor for me within the seminary, he has post polio syndrome. He recently died recently, but he. You know, he had polio, he got the vaccine, but it never quite completely fixed him, okay? So he was always in constant pain, couldn't hardly walk very well. And I kept waiting for, you know, God to heal somebody like him, very devoted follower of Jesus. Uh, people that were blind, people that were missing limbs, never saw any of that. Now, i tell you what I did see. I saw a lot of people, oh, I was just feeling so lousy, people prayed for me and I felt better. Um, 
you know, I had cancer. Um, you guys prayed for me, real positive experience. I go back, the doctor says I'm in remission. You know, it's like there was a lot of things that when you really analyze the timeline, a lot of these people like uh, cancer remission stories were, were pretty common, but these people were getting prayed for 20, 30 times before it went into remission. And so did it just go into remission became my question. Uh, but I never really saw any true miracles, uh, never saw a leper you know, become cleansed of his leprosy, never saw anybody raised from the dead. Um, so nothing like that. And there was, you know, there's these phases that go through Pentecostal churches as a general rule and, you know, the name it and claim it, the blab it and grab it kind of thing where you just, you know, speak that seed faith into existence, um, which I opposed even back then. Um, but I also, you know, the demon of this, like every demon thing that could be cast out was cast out, you know, and it's like, and then, you know, I would look at people that had certain medical conditions that looked like demon possession. I mean, is that really demon possession or just a medical condition? Um, miracles of, preserva uh, you know, uh, provision, like all of a sudden we had enough of this or enough of that. And if you went and looked into it a little bit more deeply, some secret person had actually, you know, delivered that. It wasn't a miracle. It was somebody just felt sorry for that person. Oh, you know, I just, I mean, I went to the door, our kids were hungry, I didn't have any groceries, and I opened the door and there's like bags of groceries. I don't hear anybody driving the driveway, I hear everybody knock. And I'm like, you know, it could very well have been, you were so distraught about your situation, you didn't hear those things. And so the provision isn't a miracle, it's just somebody being kind to you. Um, the one thing that I can tell you about Pentecostal churches and the stories that you'll hear in them is often something is very small and mundane, and by the time you hear it two weeks later, it has grown into this massive, super miracle thing. Okay, it's become a legendary thing. You know, somebody got, you know, they had a headache, and the headache went away, you know, and it's like, oh, I know that I had a brain tumor, and God, you guys prayed for me, and the brain tumor was gone. And by the time it's done, you know, you get the story back around. Um, it's just weird. Um, Twice I saw women in the Pentecostal church convince themselves that they were pregnant and had all the symptoms. They, you know, they got, they got large. They, you know, stopped having their menstrual cycle. They, I mean, the whole nine yards. They even tested positive on a pregnancy test. But when they got a physical examination, the, the physicians like calls in the husbands both time and goes, uh, "Your wife isn't pregnant. She's just, you know, she's got a physiological condition." And that's how I know the power of suggestive attitudes, the suggestive services, and all that. And how there's a real power in getting an emotional high or an emotional low. Or uh, I had one preacher talk to me about priming the pump. And that's the other thing. How many charlatans and frauds do you think I saw over the years? I saw people, well, we're all going to get slain in the spirit. Well, people weren't falling over on the power. So you have the guy and he'd shove them over. You know, it's like... Um, the expectation, uh, you know, I, I literally saw one guy pull one of the oldest tricks in the book, which was to grab a cane from a woman next to the other guy, but then tell the other guy that actually could walk to walk up and run it down and then give the cane back to the old woman. So you don't need that anymore, but here it is. And it's like, the guy's like, that's not my cane, it's the lady next to me. You know, this kind of fraud stuff, uh, once headsets became available, I am fairly certain you know, uh, Papafoff or whatever his name was that uh, the amazing Randy exposed. I'm sure he wasn't the only one that was using hidden air pieces to, you know, tell him things about the congregation to present like he had some prophetic or whatever powers. Um, what it became really to me is I began to realize a lot of it was fraudulent or fat, you know, bad. And then the politics. Some people are just really good at, at you know, manipulating and making people do what they want. And I'm going to say this, I see a lot, I won't say it's it's necessarily terrible, but a lot of sociopaths inhabit churches because they like to use the emotions. And Pentecostals are the worst because you can manipulate Pentecostal believers that don't really have any backbone or spine. Somebody with a real lot of confidence 
and who can preach with confidence can definitely manipulate people. And I saw a lot of sociopaths in the pulpit and in the pew over the years, and uh, those kind of people like to manipulate people. And I wouldn't stop seeing them after I left the Pentecostal church, but they seem to be in an overabundance. Now, what does that have to do with Jesus? Well, I suddenly began to realize in this time off, I was just thinking about it, and I said, well, as I'm reading the stories of Jesus and I'm going through the life of Christ again on my own, just for my own personal enrichment again, and uh, I suddenly realized something, that what you could have with Jesus is, doggone it, you could have a faith healer. You could really have somebody who uses this idea of emotionalism and emotional high. Now, there's a, there's a verse in the scriptures right at the end of the Sermon on the Mount where the people are astonished because he speaks with authority and not as the scribes. In other words, he's speaking with a great deal of confidence. And I'm going to tell you something, as, a, as somebody who watched different preachers in Pentecost, the preachers that everybody loved were the ones that were the most confident preachers, the ones that were absolutely confident in what they were doing. And people glommed onto that emotionally, and those were the same people that were getting all these you know, experiences. Um, I began to realize that Jesus could very well, if he had the right kind of personality, if he was the right kind of person, he could definitely have been a, a faith healer today. Okay, that he could have, you know, figured out different ways of making people, you know, look one way or the other. Um, you know, casting out demons, what is that? You know, is it epilepsy? And then somebody, you know, he comes along and just calms the person down and everybody thinks it's healing. But then nobody bothers to follow up because he's moved on. He's an itinerant preacher. Okay, I began to realize that the miracle stories could really have been something really small and innocuous. And by the time they got into the Bible after literally decades of oral tradition recopying the story, they could have been completely blown out of proportion. Um, some of the things that Jesus does could very well be magical tricks. Um, I think Penn and Teller did the water into wine one, okay, and showed how that could be done. Uh, was Jesus in some ways fraudulent, like the raising from the dead? Were those setups? Because I saw people in Pentecost set things up, okay, like, they would have somebody come in that was, you know, supposedly lame or whatever, and then he would, you know, people would give them up. I mean, if you've ever watched some of the movies like Leap of Faith, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's a lot of things that can be done to simulate and fool people. And I began to realize that a lot of that could also have been a part of Jesus. I mean, how would people back then have discovered it? You, you don't have cameras, so you can go back and look at it again. I mean... The easiest thing in the world to be back then would have been a faith healing fraud that claimed to be the Messiah, seeing everybody was claiming to be the Messiah in Palestine at the time. I suddenly realized that Jesus very well, if he did exist, could have been a fraud. He could have been a complete fraud and everybody believed in him and liked his teachings. None of his teachings are really unique. They're from the same school of, of rabbinical school that already existed. He has some interesting little spins here and there, some of the teachings do. But really, all of the stuff that's built up around him, the story that's built up around him, is all this oral tradition of different events that it could have been him or somebody else, and all of a sudden they glom it together, and it becomes a continuing growing legend. I'm already dealing with the fact that Jesus is a growing legend. Well, what fueled that legend became my question. Well, what if he was just a faith healer? What if he was just one of these fraudulent faith healers that set things up, that made things look good, who also happened to be really good at people, who could get a following, could get people, you know, he appoints his 12, and, you know, that way nobody's really directly contacting him very often because he's got all these intermediaries between him and the people. And that is very, very suspicious because a lot of faith healers, a lot of people order out their ministry that way because they don't want to directly deal with people because people can kind of pick up maybe that they're a fraud. And Jesus does this. I began to realize that Jesus could be a great combination of a false faith healer and somebody who really knew people well and who had a great deal of confidence when he spoke. Now, I've said before, you know, I get the mythicist position and I can see why they would have that. And I don't have any argue with, with them or quarrel with them. I personally think the fact that Josephus mentions Jesus' brother James 
that Josephus didn't have a problem with the idea that Jesus of Nazareth existed. Um, that's not concrete proof, but it's better than a lot of other things, and it's a real mundane claim to prove somebody existed. If he did exist, though, what was he? What was he really? And I came to a realization that the stories could grow, the oral, oral traditions could get growing, the miracles and everything could have been set up, they could have been fraudulent. How would you know back then? If Jesus was a, a magician in the sense of we think of like Penn and Teller and some of the other magicians, then how would we know? How would people back then know if those people kept their secrets and tried to pass them off as something that they were not? Um, I'm not sure that we would ever, um, ever know. And that was when I began to, as I, I moved into my last church, I began to really search for what proof do we have that Jesus is what he said he was that's so concrete that I can get past these doubts and objections. Um, when I left Pentecost, um, this was some of the stuff that was going on through my mind for a year. I was really ready to give it all up, give up the whole you know, preaching thing and go do something else. At that time, I was like 38, 39 years old. I could have easily uh, shifted into a different career, gone back to school then and shifted into a different career. And I had plenty of time to do better for my family and so on and so forth. But um, there would be a phone call that I would get that would convince me to give it one more try. And um, boy, there are days that I really wish I hadn't uh, answered that phone call. But I wanted to get this one out. It's a reflection on my time in Pentecost and how it began to color an un, uh, a different understanding in my mind of who Jesus could have been. And uh, I'm thinking that uh, you know, that began to change me. And as I went into my last church, I would discover that I had a lot more theological freedom. I had a lot more freedom in a lot of respects that I'll talk about in my next video. But I wanted to get this one out. I know I promised that I would do you know, congregational church. I'll probably do two videos on that, maybe three, uh, because there's a lot to that as far as my deconversion. That's where my deconversion takes place. So there's a lot of things going on in that final church that are really germane to the discussion of deconversion. So I'll get to that when I get there. But this is a video for today on some of the thoughts I had about Pentecostalism and how it colored my view of Jesus. And uh, so thank you for stopping by. I appreciate every like, share, and subscribe. Hit that join button, uh, you know, become part of the Rabid Nation. If you subscribe, you're a part of the Rabid Nation, but I always appreciate those that buy their citizenry. At least I'm honest about it. Um, and so thank you very much, and I appreciate each and every one of you. We're getting closer and closer. Um, every video I drop gets us closer. I'm moving to from three to four videos a week. I'm focusing more and more on... Uh, breaking things up and doing things in smaller bites. So thank you very, very much for your patience as I make all these changes. I appreciate it. Uh, thank once again for stopping by, and I'll uh, catch you next time.